Sanarupa Das teaches introductory and honors courses in economics. Her teaching experience includes both traditional and online teaching at graduate and undergraduate levels. Dr. Das has taught at various institutions, including Indiana University in Bloomington, Western Carolina University, Northern Virginia Community College, and Strayer University. She currently is a board member of the Eastern Community College Social Science Association. She obtained her master's degree in economics from the prestigious Delhi School of Economics in Delhi, India. She has a PhD in economics from Indiana University in Bloomington. It was a very challenging experience for me and it was also, um, it was, uh, it also led to innovation in teaching in the classroom. So that way I, I think it was uh, wonderful. Uh, when I got the fellowship, I thought I'd do something on, uh, um, I'd do something maybe on Cesar Chavez or I'd do something on, uh, maybe the economic impact of slavery, something like that. I find something, I fit that into the course. Because in uh, standard course, there is really no room for discussion of race. Okay, we talk about things like market mechanisms, we talk about things like measurement of income, um, unemployment, uh, we talk about economic policies, fiscal and monetary, and uh, there is really no room for race. Um, but I wanted things to be really integrated and uh, to make sense for the students, why they're doing something in their economics class, why they're going to the museum. And uh, I realized that uh, integration is a very hard thing. Doing something interdisciplinary is really hard. But anyway, lucky for me, the race exhibit uh, came up. It started in sometimes in uh, June. It's not a permanent exhibit. Uh, but when I saw it, I saw that there were several things in there that would be relevant for my class. So. I decided to use that one. Um, I planned right away. Um, it was in the syllabus from the very beginning. And uh, I, I decided to have an entrance narrative from the students to know where they stand, uh, what they know about race. I then wanted to give them some readings on the history of race, um, because we have a we have students. Uh, we have students who are immigrants. I didn't know how much U.S. history they know. Whether they have taken history classes, so um, I thought history, knowing something on the history, would be relevant. Um, then, of course, we had we have to visit the museum, and I wanted that to be structured too. Um, I didn't want them to go here and there, but to focus on the economic aspects within that exhibit. Then we had readings that are based on race and economics, and uh, we had homework based on that. And then I introduced something for the digital project. Every student had to uh, do something digitally, and uh, that was something very different I did here, and I'm glad I did that. Uh, the entrance narrative basically asked them, uh, post an introduction of, about yourself, and then uh, I asked them this question, what is race? Uh, do you perceive yourself as belonging to some race? Do you think that race matters in the 21st century? And, and everybody responded, and I just have uh, just some some things out here to uh, tell you what they wrote. And I picked students who were African uh, immigrants, who were Asian American, Black American, White American. Everything is in, in here. You have a many students responding. But basically, I think if I read the first one, in general, race is still an important factor in this century, but not the same as it was 100 years ago. I think that was the predominant, that was uh, what students were writing predominantly. Most of the students wrote something like that. Uh, the last one you can see is, uh, says race is a tremendous deal in the 21st century. And only one student felt that strongly. The others said, yes, race matters, but they were still very positive about it. They thought uh, it's not as important as it was before, or there are ways they can handle it, there are ways they can overcome it. They were very positive about it. Um, so I felt good about that, and uh, we moved on with our readings. And first I gave them uh, two readings. One uh, was by the anthropologist uh, Audrey Smedley, and Another one was by the historian Barbara Pierce. Uh, both actually came from this, uh, oops, 
both actually came from this uh, website that you see there. Uh, it's called understandingrace.org. Uh, yeah. So um, I got both of them from there. Um, and students, we had a wonderful discussion, very productive discussion in the classroom based on that. Uh, some students had taken history classes, they knew these things, while other students didn't know about these things. So they were surprised by uh, Audrey Smedley writes uh, before, at the early stages of the colonial period. There were actually no, uh, no not much distinction between uh, uh, blacks and whites. In fact, the term black and white comes much later. And uh, Smedley writes that indentured uh, laborers could actually buy their freedom later on. They could get out of indenture and then they could enjoy the same status in the society as a European uh, immigrant. And um, so, so many students were surprised at that. They said, oh, really? I didn't know that. And uh, so, and then Fields, uh, Fields had one thing that, uh, that was, uh, that was something that I learned, and I think it was, uh, uh, it surprised my students as well. Uh, Fields talks about uh, how did race come up, and she says that it came up as a justification uh, because how, how can you have, uh, how can you have a set of people who, who are empowered with freedom? Uh, who have so much freedom, and how can you have enslavement or bondage for another set of people? How can you justify that? The only way to justify that was to say that these set of people who we hold uh, in enslavement, they're actually inferior. Yeah, that's how the race argument came up, and so that was new to them, and that was new to me. She also read an article by Eric Fonart, a simple article, uh, talked about New Deal and how the the domestic laborers and uh, the domestic workers and agricultural workers were actually left out of social security uh, in the New Deal. And uh, so we discussed social security, and you know, social security is also in news so much now, whether it's going to go past or not. And so we anyway, we discussed these things. We had a very good, uh, very productive, very nice discussion in class. We then visited the museum October 14th. Um, I had two sessions. Um, I was there. We went as a class. Uh, but I asked them to come at any time. They could come at 11 o'clock time. They could come at 1.30. Um, some students came with their friends, uh, but only a few. Uh, most of them came with their classmates, though. They traveled together in the train or uh, they, they came together. And uh, I had uh, handouts for them. I said, being a teacher, it's hard for me not to have handouts. And uh, so actually from race.org, I had printed out some things. Uh, and uh, it, uh, they had little, uh, like a one-page information on maybe on immigration law or something on Jesse versus Ferguson, things like that they had. And I actually put it out in the front, and I said, you can pick anyone that you like, that you would like to pick. I don't care which one you pick. And so they picked one that they liked, and I gave them a handout, uh, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And most of them stayed more than an hour, and uh, they went uh, through the exhibit, and some of them actually stayed for a very long time. They sat down, they chatted with me, they shared some uh, even personal things. So. Um, I thought it was a very nice visit. Uh, in the hand, this is the handout that they got. And basically, I pointed to them that these are the different uh, sections in the exhibit. And you must go to at least these few. So you must go to Creating the Race, watch a video there. What did you learn from one of the speakers here? You must go to Separate and Unequal, that part of the exhibit, and uh, watch a video there. And then focus on some governmental policies that were discriminatory. Then uh, the, the last part is uh, I asked them to go, which was towards the back of the exhibit. I want to make sure they go there. That talked about wealth inequality, uh, GI Bill, and uh, how did, uh, how did uh, uh, the housing laws, FHA laws, 
actually um, were discriminatory. So I wanted to make sure they go there. And uh, they did. They actually found that, that part fascinating, the housing part. So this is the other side. I don't think I need to go in there. Um, so they, they found this. Uh, this is the exhibit with the wealth inequality. They were fascinated that. So one of the towers represents the wealth of the whites, the other tower uh, of the Asians, and uh, then the blacks and the uh, Latinos. And they were surprised that the blacks had the least amount of wealth on all this. And uh, maybe it was everybody gravitated towards that part of the exhibit. So when we came back um, from the museum, I gave them an article by Gorman, another article by Bob Gorson. Uh, they talked about wealth inequality and discrimination. And uh, we had uh, we had very good discussion on those. And uh, one of the things the Gorman article talks about is actually that market, if you have free market, uh, discrimination will impose a penalty on the on the businessman, on the entrepreneur. Okay. So if you have free market, the free market will actually take care of this too much. Um, so um, we went through that, why it was that. Um, does anybody know this picture? It's actually hard to see probably. It's a picture of a street car. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and during the Jim Crow era, the streetcars um, didn't want to follow the Jim Crow laws because they actually resisted. In some cases, they resisted it for 15 years, as long as 15 years, uh, because they simply said that it doesn't. Uh, um, it, 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 it's not profit maximizing for them to have those uh, to obey those laws. Uh, it was uh, too expensive to lug around cars only with white people when you have seats empty, when they put, um, you know, put in black people. Um, so, um, so they were actually surprised. The students were actually surprised when they read these examples. There was also an, another example in that article where um, the, the mining industry in South Africa in the 1900s, they were actually hiring black workers. They wanted to hire black workers because black workers were less expensive. Uh, until apartheid became very strong, they actually resisted hiring white workers. And that's the kind of thing we talked about in, in the class, that if you have a taste for discrimination, you can have it. It's your taste. But then the market will impose a penalty on you because if you want to hire just white workers, uh, and you have to pay. You are drawing workers from a smaller pool of workers. You have to pay higher wages, which would mean higher cost, which would mean lower profit. And eventually, you can have another entrepreneur who is not non-discriminatory, and that person will be able to hire workers at a uh, lower wage, have higher profits, and maybe drive you out of business. So free market actually imposes penalty. And, but that was something that was fascinating to them. Um, we also talked about wage differentials. So when you see a wage differential, does that immediately mean that uh, there is a discrimination? Uh, well, you have to think about it. And uh, some people have done research on it later on, and they showed, no, that's really not true. There are omitted variables. We sometimes leave out variables uh, that can affect and that can uh, make the wage differential, that can account for the wage differential. And variables such as uh, the quality of your education. Um, maybe people who are getting the higher wages, they also have uh, longer years in education. And uh, if you account for those things, actually wage uh, differential goes down. So they have to critically think about things. And uh, not everybody agreed in class. They said, how is this possible? I said, well, then you have to go study more. You have to look into those papers. You have to see. Um, whether uh, how they have done it, how they have done that work to give that result, but but you have to be critical about it. You have to think critical. Um, this was their homework one. How did the idea of race originate in the United States? Uh, 
discuss this with the reference to the paper that we have studied. So throughout my homework, I wanted to make sure that they go back to their readings. They just don't tell me their opinion. They, they, they have to ground it in economics. What are some areas within race that economists have worked on? What are the different sources of discrimination mentioned in the Gorman article? Is wage differential in labor market explained only through discrimination? Explain your answer with actual studies that have been done. So that was, uh, it was very focused on what we have read. And um, um, I had time enough to give back uh, the writing to the students before the second homework came in. And uh, they got, uh, they, they had some time to get feedback, and I, I think it was a good writing experience for them. And then this was the second homework, and um, how does the free market take care of discrimination, explain with an example that is given in the Gorman article, and so on. I, I do all those things. And then the last part, actually, um, I don't want to take too much time, the last part here, Based on our readings and the museum exhibit visit, are you able to approach the issue of race more analytically? In other words, are you able to see the race issue with the eye of an economist? So I wanted to know that from them. And to me, that was very important. That after all this, um, has economic understanding contributed to you? And uh, the answer was very positive. Students, um, students picked up different things from their readings and discussions and they said, uh, yes, it has, it has uh, changed the way uh, they think about this and think more than um, I did a digital project with my students. This was a group project. And um, um, I think I have to refine this group project a little bit if I do it in the future, because in one class, I made the groups very big. And in other class, I make the group uh, relatively small. So I think um, I, I had actually mixed experience. But I think from students' point of view, they wanted small group. Although one of my large groups did very well. They actually made a wonderful video that I don't have today, but maybe on the main part we can share. It was a really nice video. Um, so there were different kinds of things that they did for the digital project. They did blogs, they did websites. Um, one person made this Jeopardy game. I can show that to them at the end. Um, do we have time for this? OK. Um, so she is actually a, a student. She was not my student, but one student went and interviewed her. She is a GI. And um, so she talked about the GI Bill and whether it had impacted her life and whether she thought it was uh, discriminatory or not. Um, so that was that about. Um, overall assessment, I think uh, these were the benefits for me. It was a challenging project because I think it was a new area uh, that I delved into, the new area of race and economics. It allowed innovation in the classroom, I think, because I included the digital project. I also expanded the written assignments in the class, uh, which I have not done. Uh, then uh, it reinforced the economic way of thinking, because we were looking at race analytically. And so uh, when I'm teaching, I'm always uh, trying to enforce on my students that uh, you have to think, in, think like an economist. And I think uh, this, this was an issue that was so dear to their heart. And they had opinions about it, and yet they had to go and think of it in a different way. And it was very rewarding for me, because I think uh, the student experience was very good. The students uh, really responded, and they did well. So it was rewarding for me. Uh, for the students, I think uh, the benefit was that they, they liked the learning outside the classroom. They really liked the museum visit that one day they go out, no class, going out to the museum. That was really nice for them. Um, I think uh, they, they enjoyed the discussion because it was an issue close to their heart. Uh, again, they liked the economic way of thinking of, of that issue. 
And, but the downside I think one student mentioned is that it reduced time in the classroom for discussion of other things. So it reduced time for other topics. So, uh, so I think that uh, that was a downside. I somehow have to um, accommodate for that in a different way. This is the student evaluation. Um, I just picked two of the questions that uh, Sarah had handed out before. Uh, so one of the questions was, I thought uh, about something in a new way as a result of Smithsonian experience. And I have 25 students uh, respond to that. And uh, you can see most of them either strongly agreed or agreed. Okay. So I thought that was a very nice number. And then the other question is, I am more aware of the result of my, uh, as a result of my Smithsonian experience, that public institutions like museums are available to me as a resource. I think that's what Manjula wants to know. And, uh, and again, here the student response of the 25 students was very strong. They were strongly agreed with what they did. So I, I thought that was very nice. Um, these are the different readings that we did. And uh, and these are some pictures from the visit. exactly like Jeopardy and they had questions in different categories, race category, government, census, and all that, and you would choose 10 points for race or 20 points for uh, government and so on. And you could say that again. But otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you.